We are in Orcho Tzedikim, and it's, uh, please uh, subscribe, to, uh, subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, hit the notification bell, like it and comment, do whatever you need to do, or you should bring it up in your ratings, and then you won't miss a class, <laughs> unless you try to. <laughs> okay, so 266, we're on the gate of hatred. And uh, he says, you must know that one who hates others will be hated by them. And one who st stirs up hatred in his heart brings evil upon himself. And love that is not for the sake of heaven turns into great uh, hatred and jealousy. As is written in reference to Amnon, we did this last week, but I'll do it again. And Amnon despised her with a great hatred. His hatred for her was even greater than the love that he had had for her. Second, uh, Second Samuel. Uh, okay, so, uh, and I, well, I did this last week, but so I'll, I'll skip what the notes are, but I would advise you to read the note when you get a chance. So do not treat the, uh, the counsel of a hater or an enemy, as is written. Excessive are the kisses of a foe. And he says his, he displays feelings of love as a means to trap and bring down his victim. Know that there are many. Know that many show love in their words, though they may be full. They be full-fledged haters in their hearts, and one should not believe them, as is written. With his lips, the hater hides his hatred, yet in his inner self he stores up deceit. Although he smooths over his tongue and talks gently to you. Do not incline your heart toward him, as is written. When he makes his voice ingratiating, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations. Okay. Uh, and in his heart, so he says, the number seven does not mean specifically seven abominations, but rather numerous abominations. Just as you have showed Avner ben Nir and Amasa ben uh, Keser, the Yeser, and, uh, peace and love until he killed them, and as Ishmael ben Nasania did to Gedaliah ben Achikam until he killed them. So you have all these stories of uh, people feigning love for the individual, and in the end, killing them uh, uh, because they were unaware. That is, and he didn't want to believe people, that in, and certainly in the case of Gedalia, because Gedalia was told that he was going to be killed by Yishmael, his cousin. And he said he couldn't do that, he loves me, blah, blah, blah. Well, that would be the, the end for him, and that's thus we have the fast of Gedalia. <laughs> does, does he explain this further? Is it, is it, or are these people engaging in subterfuge by feigning love, or they just don't realize it? No, no, they do. No, subterfuge. They're feigning it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's what he's saying. Ah. That's his point. Yeah. Ah. Uh, his, his point was uh, that you can't trust the counsel of the hater or the enemy. That's what he's saying. So you have somebody who, uh, again, they come across with. Yeah. Uh, trying to ingratiate themselves to you, oh but you know really that they're not your friends. Ah, but you, ah. we have a tendency to want to believe the language and to believe the sincerity of people, even though we know. Okay, so we know that they're they're wicked. So we you, we know that they're not our friends. So so, uh, inside you really know that this person has this dislike and hatred. Uh, and he's, in other words, uh, he is trying to rub up to you to make you believe otherwise, and, and you're seeing you, you shouldn't fall for it. You know, I, I have to, I know that the world is not going to like me for this, so I'm, I'm, I'm telling the world you're not going to like me. When I, my first year of education, when I was teaching, my first year, I was a Rebbe for the sixth grade, uh, fifth grade. Fifth grade. It was a mixed class of boys and three boys, three girls, small class. I think, th whatever, it was a small class. And uh, girls, I realized, and I never knew this before, I have a sister, but I never knew how evil <laughs> girls are. What? They, they, th boys are simple. Boys are simple. 
I don't like you, I hit you. Ah. Done. It's, it's a simple thing. Uh, uh, there's, there's no peck, the pecking order is the stronger guy, the bully, whatever. There's a pecking order, okay? So you understand the guy. It, it's, that wasn't hard. Girls, they're so, and then that, it never changed, by the way. They're so, uh, how do you say it? <laughs> they're, they're non, it doesn't make sense. Right, so what happens is, they, there's three or four, okay? And you would think that one is always going to be the top dog. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Girls are vicious. Girls uh, can be down with their own selves. They're diverse with themselves. And so if, you're, if you were the, today, you're the queen, to, tomorrow you're the dog. That's it, you're, you're outside. And you have to, all this maneuvering that you have to do, that would be, I'm telling you. If, my, my brother told me the same story. It's, it's the most amazing thing. Like I said, boys are simple. You beat, they beat each other up. They like each other. They don't like each other, period. It's not a matter. You're afraid you're not. Girls, it was, it's not, it was not normal for, for a guy. It's just not normal. You're talking about what is your problem? You can't even take down the queen bee because the queen bee is only there for a second. And then the other one takes over. And, they're, and there's a deceiving, there's, like I said, I know people are going to hate me for that, but it's, that's what I noticed. And again, I was a young teacher, but it was unbelievable how I see that. And I even see it today with, with my, uh, when my kids come home with their stories. And, you, uh, and I love you one second, now I don't love you. My best friend, no, my best friend, no, it's craziness. It's really, it doesn't make sense. And uh, so here, if you know somebody, and by the way, again, if let's say, and again, this really only applies to, I've only seen it applying in real life to girls, where the girl, the woman or the girl would be uh, like a conniving person. I'll use you for when I want you, but then I'm going to turn on you. Once you, I guess you do see it in, uh, with guys too, but not as often as with women. And so some women will try to convince the new kid in the block, you know, this, this person is going to turn on you when it's, not, when it's not to your advantage. And of course, we don't believe them because the person is being nice to me. So I'm using you. Now this, by the way, this would go across all sexes. I, but it's just, I see it more with women than men. But the same thing would be with a man. Mm. If a man needs you, and that's what we say about the government's in Pirkei Avot. When the government needs you, they're your friend. Oh. It's in Pirkei Avot, they're I your friend. Say, it sounds like politics in here today. All right, they're your friend, 100% they're your friend. When they don't, yeah. but when yeah. you need them, to use my father's language, <laughs> then they, they, they say, I'm right behind you. You have to ask him uh, how far. <laughs> okay, you're not, in other words, you're not backing me up. When, or they don't even know who you are. So that's how they'll act. So that's, again, what he's referring to. Like I said, I saw it as, in practical terms, in the fifth grade, what was going on. I was just, it was just such a mind-blowing experience. Uh, it was, again, my first year of teaching, and it's not something you were expecting. You can have all the psychology classes in the, uh, in the world, but until you actually see it in action, you, you don't believe it. You just think you could control. No, no, it's just, it doesn't make sense to a guy. It makes sense to a girl. Girls all understand it. Women understand it. And they can maneuver that, but it's training. But, and we look at them and saying, whoa, that, that's, that's mean. And thus you have, by the way, uh, Mean Girls, the movie. Oh. Mean Girls 1, Mean Girls 2, Mean Girls 3. I think they had three, uh, I think they did the three of those. But Mean Girls, where they made an actual movie about how they can, they, they can connive. And I asked my, I mean, I, I knew it was true when I, uh, when I heard the, the scheme of the movie, but I, don't, I doubt they played it totally correctly, but it, it's just so true. But that's what he's talking about that you have these people who act like you are friends, but you know, yeah, yeah. you know that they're not, and, you, and there's a piece bothering you. Well, what we'd say is listen to that piece. 
Don't trust this. Okay. So he. Uh, so now we go on, and he says, "One of the sages said the best tactic to take against your foe is to show him love, if you're able. If you're able to show personal love, because what happens is, and here again I'll go on a personal level. I had a roommate who was uh, at, at UMass, uh, not a Jewish person, and not a nice guy, just not a nice guy. Roommate." A roommate, just not a nice guy. He used to crank call me. We had a telephone in the room. He used to, because he wanted me out of the room. So he used to, he wanted to make me miserable so I would leave, so he could get his friend in, which I never did. Uh, but he would uh, literally call me, because they didn't have cell phones. <laughs> no. They had the, the, the uh, landlines only. So he would call the telephone and make it ring. I would pick up, hello? There'll be nobody answering. And during my studying time, he was doing this. Oh. And I knew it was him, just knew it was him. And then I was so trying to sleep. It only happened when he walked out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I was sleeping, uh, he would turn the lights on. Yeah, yeah, what, what are your wonderful types of roommates? The, the uh, horrors of roommates. Well, Baruch Hashem, the semester came to an end. He got to be with his friend who he really wanted to be with. I got a new roommate, Baruch Hashem, and that actually was be a Jewish kid, I think, and we would remain friends to this very day, actually, so we're still friendly. And, uh, but the point is, when I would see him on campus, this, this uh, Schmandrick, <laughs> figure it out, okay? <laughs> when, I was, when I would see this guy, I would always say, how you doing? He would never answer me. Ooh, you're being too nice to him. I was being nice. How are you doing? I hope everything's good. That's it. That's great. Like and that. his friend, after the fourth or fifth time of me doing that, and him not answering me, he said to him, stop being an idiot. He's being nice to you. Answer him back. So that was wow. interesting. Wow. Again, we never became best buds. We, nothing like that happened. But... They're right. If you want to overcome, beat this guy, what you do is you show love to them. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? This, you know, I know it's not your fault and you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, it's idiots. Let, I can't help you. Love doesn't mean, no. love just means being nice no, to the person. What does it mean when you're able? When are you not able? Let's say the person just hurt you so much. Hmm. You're, not going, you're not able to. Now, by the way, uh, I want to say for that too. If you're ever not able to forgive somebody, you're really hurting yourself. Right. right. You're just hurting yourself. But some people have a real hard time looking at somebody with a civility because of the hurt they put up with. But like I said, when you, if you're at that level, in reality, you're still holding that. And there's a very nice story in the Gemara where there was a rabbi who was, two rabbis were walking, with a rabbi and a student, really. And so... Uh, they come to uh, a river, and there's a young lady trying to cross the river. So the, ra what, the, old, the rabbi picks the girl up, brings her to the other side of the river, puts her down, and that's it. The, the student has watched this whole thing. He's bothered by it, and he's walking with the rabbi, and blah, 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 maybe uh, two miles later. So he... Uh, he said to the rabbi, I don't understand. How could you do it? He said, how could I do what? How could you pick up the girl and carry her across the river? He said, well, because it meant nothing to me, but obviously it meant a lot to you because you've been carrying that girl for two, for two miles already. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? So <laughs> if I carry my, the animosity that I have, you got the case? Okay. So if I carry the animosity that I have for this guy, or for the, for the person that bothered me. So that means that person has got under my skin so much yeah. that I'm carrying them wherever I go. Now I can talk about the case and I can laugh about it today. And even in those days, because it meant nothing to me. That, that, again, I, uh, you have idiots and have bigger idiots. I always understood that. But I, when you have to be a roommate with one of them, it's hard. But you, so, but you, you survive. You do what you have to do and you survive. But I'm not going to carry this through my life and say, oh, that guy should, uh, you know, whatever. Let him have done it in 20 hours. I don't care. I hope he matured. 
you know. Mm. Hope he's not train calling his wife. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever the case going to be. I hope he watches this and hears himself famous. Yeah. Crank calling, crank calling is. Oh, uh, I used to call it crank, but it may be prank calling. Oh. It's probably, what do you call it, crank or prank? No, it's crank with a P, but it's okay, we understood. Okay, I thought it was a crank call. Yeah. Yeah, you you, heard, you uh, called it crank or you? Cr- uh, you understood I, crank? I would say if the guy, a crank call would be if a guy actually would talk to you unidentified and start uh, making uh, crazy statements or threatening things. Oh, okay. That would be a, Okay. But maybe a prank would be because he's, he's just simply, when you pick up, he's simply hanging up, right? Uh, no, he would stay there. He just well, wouldn't stay And that same Both thing? calls are referred to prank calls. Prank? Okay. Right. Prank. It, well, he would just hold the phone. You would say hello, and he just would hold the phone and not talk. Right. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 Prank, prank, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is you don't know if it's somebody else. Right. So that that's your headache. Yeah. Again, you're. Really done Star sixty seven or something. Star sixty nine in those days. Star sixty nine. Yeah. Star. All right. But uh, because, uh, well, I and was that around then? Star sixty nine. Uh, yeah. uh, the the, ans- the answer <laughs> is that we didn't have push button. Get out. What year was it? It was seventies, but we didn't have uh, seventy eight. But the dorms didn't have yeah, push yeah. button. Uh, the dorms. No, so it was one one six nine. Yeah, they, they were still a lot of time. They told you later yeah. how to yeah. do the stars oh, okay. on the rotary. But the okay, but we had rotaries on the, on the uh, campus. Yeah, sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I don't think people knew about the stars. Probably not. The probably not. <laughs> probably not. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes he says hatred is a mitzvah. Like hating a wicked person who does not accept a reprimand. So he says, a wicked person who does not accept a reprimand, much deliberation is needed before labeling someone a wicked person. Moreover, if a reprimand is not accepted, uh, <clears throat> it may not have been given in a proper manner. This being the case, it is suggested that a competent Torah authority be consulted before any conclusion is reached. Fine. So it says, it's the midst of to hate him, as it's written, it is the fear, it is fear of Hashem to hate evil. Yerot uh, so it's, that's the point. Yerot Shemayim, uh, Ra. It's the fear of heaven that caused one to hate evil. Uh, and do not, and do I not hate those who hate you, Hashem, and dispute those who rise up against you? That's probably uh, King David, I'm guessing. Yeah. I have with them the ultimate hatred, they have become my foes. Like I said, that's King David. Uh, one must hate falsehood and deceit. In summary, one must hate anything which distance, distances him and deters him from the love of the creator of all. As is written, I, hate, I have hated every false path. This is a great principle. One must hate every manner of falsehood. The more he hates the ways of falsehood, the more he will love Torah. As is written, I have hated and despised falsehood. Your Torah I love, and one must love truth and peace. As is written, love truth and peace. She says, the uh, beginning of the verse says that at the time of the redemption, the public fast days of the 17th of the was 9th of Av, some Gedoya, 10th of David, will be transformed into days of joy and happiness. Soon as David explains that this verse ends with the words love, truth, and peace, because this is a condition. That is a condition. Those fast days will be transformed only when the Jewish nation loves truth and peace. Yeah. yeah. That's hate. When you talk about hatred, I think you hate the wrong, the falsehood, and whatnot, and that's that's the right, correct way. That hatred in your car, you're not actually going to go out and attack like other religions. Or no, right. you're not attacking anybody. What what it says is correct. You're you're uh, hating means uh, that you're going to stay away from it, mm-hmm. right? That's real. What real hatred is doing for you? I have a sin offer. I, I'm not going to be involved in it. A person would hate lashon hara. Let's see, would had a person. That's not, uh, the Chavis Chaim, the only one in history that I know of who hated lashon hara. Okay, mm-hmm. everybody else seems to. And go for it, but he wrote books on it and the problems of it, and so uh, 
But what happened is they said when somebody would be speaking Lashon Hara, they would start to go like this. <laughs> he trained himself to fall asleep. So he wouldn't be part of it. Or, uh, and they, I think, I think he had a problem hearing as he got older. And they said to him, uh, he's in the 1900s, he dies in the 1900s, they probably had some sort of a hearing aid or uh, the, the horn. He was it the 1930s or something? He lived in the 1930s? I think he lived in the 1930s. He certainly lived that late. So he, he could have had, he could have been given something to hear yeah, better with. He had hearing aid. He had to put a horn to your ear or something. Right? right. So they would ask him why he doesn't want to do it. He said, I fought for years not to listen to Lashon Hara. Wow. Now Hashem's going to be a brothel. Wow. So it's an interesting way. If he really said it, I don't know, but that's the story that goes on about him. So it's an interesting way to look at uh, deafness. And, but that would be the case where I hate it so much, I can't, I, I reject it, so I can't be around it. And therefore, I don't do it. I avoid those situations. And uh, I mean, we all do it in our own lives. If you think about who surrounds you, you're not a smoker, right? Okay. Your parents aren't smokers, correct? For the most part, you don't know anybody who smokes. Right? Sorry? Okay, but for the most part, you don't know anybody in your immediate circle that you hang with every day that's smoking. If you go to college, son, you're going to have a smoker, but, but he's, you're not befriending him because he doesn't meet what you want. So again, normally, why do we do that? Because we don't like the smell. We don't like the smell. We don't like the... the, we don't like the uh, uh, our clothes smelling at that. So we stay away from that. We distance ourselves. There are times we will be around it, but again, we're not, we really try to stay away. Okay? And more than that, some, and now the real haters try to become militant, and I don't agree with the militancy. But they become the militant and say, what, what, what did I, I can't stand it? Sh sh uh, you can't smoke outside because you're polluting the ear. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> You don't like to leave the area. I can't help you with that. But uh, and like I said, we get very militant about certain things, but that's a misuse of uh, hatred, according to this. Okay. So now we're starting on the gate of mercy. We finished hate. Hatred is very short. Baruch Hashem. Okay, so now we go into mercy. So mercy is an extremely praiseworthy trait. It is one of the 13 traits attributable to, uh, attributed to Hashem as is written, merciful and compassionate. She says, it is understandable uh, to have pity on someone whom we feel deserves our compassion. But what if we feel that they are unworthy and undeserving? Must we st still be compassionate? So Tosfot says, the word chanun, compassion, implies matanat chinam, an undeserved gift. As the Gemara states, Hashem is compassionate even to those who are undeserving. So Chazal, the rabbis teach that we should strive to emulate Hashem's ways and therefore we should be compassionate even to those who we feel are unworthy. So what's an example of that? Come on. The people who you were supposed to hate before. No. Yeah. The bombs on the street. The what? The, what we call the bums on the street. Ah, we can go by with no compassion whatsoever. Cross, and these people are panhandling, and we say, "Ah, you can work, you can do this, you can do that." We have no compassion as a society. We have no compassion as individuals, for the most part. We have no compassion. We have been um, desensitized to such an extent that we can walk by them. Okay, because we see them. Now, some people will turn away because they can't stand looking at it. Yeah, but for the most so part, we could. Place. Yeah, when, right. when you were and I were much younger, it was uh, was uncommon. Maybe, like, so what is it? Uh, in New York, the Bowery, that's for a long time, right. they had bums on the street. We call bums, right? Right. But today, it's, uh, I think the impression is they're just doing it because they don't want to work. Correct. So. And again, that is... Uh, do they deserve my compassion? Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. If you have sunk to such a level that you are begging for money like that and you can't, you don't feel you can get out of that, 
you are certainly deserving of compassion. I would, I would. As a free gift. Not because I did, not because you did anything right. You did everything wrong, as a matter of fact. But uh, to get you in that situation. But that's a matan chinam, because we, when God, when we're asking Kashan for compassion, there's nothing that we can do with all the mitzvot that we do. We are the biggest, take the biggest tzaddik in the world, Moshe Rabbeinu. Anna, this, that, the other thing. He, oh, he hit the rock and then speaking the rock. That's his one sin. That's it. One sin he did in his life. And so he's going to go to Israel. Shkoyach. Okay, I will go to Israel. Did he complain? A little bit. 99 times, whatever it was. No, 597 times I think he davened. But Hashem said no. And he accepted it in the end. Okay. Wonderful. Where's my matnet chinam? Where's my free gift? Where's your compassion or bunch of them? Okay, that's what you can always argue. And, but, that, but regardless of what we do, even, even Moshe Rabbeinu, everything he got was a gift. Because we can never repay Hashem. Mm. I can never repay my parents. We've gone through this a thousand times. I can't repay someone who gave me life. It's an impossibility. Took, took care of me. God bless my parents. They took care of me without any, uh, what's it called? Uh, recipro- reciprocity yeah. for... Four years, birth. Birth to four years. I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm sitting around. <laughs> I'm a bum. <laughs> feed me, feed me, like the plant says. Feed me. That's what they knew. I'm not, I didn't bring money in. I never, my father never accepted money, but I couldn't bring money until I was at least 16. So that means you're supporting me for 16 years. By the way, I didn't go to work at 16 either. But potentially, 16 years... I didn't give him a dime. That's compassion, beyond all compassion. You give me everything. So I, I can never pay them back. So here, the Shem is giving us life. Every breath we take is because the Shem says, breathe. <laughs> Think about that. Every breath we take. We call it the autonomic system. It's, uh, I, I think it's autonomic system. Uh, medical terms. But yeah. it's uh, automatic. So... Who, but any time Shem says stop breathing, we're done. <laughs> we die. The heart stops beating, boom, it's done. It's God, it doesn't take God one second to do that, and we have to appreciate that. That's Mat Yeah. Um, what would, what would the, the author say? Um, uh, so I, I heard a story in Chicago from a woman. Uh, you know, so I guess the subject of street bombs, I'm doing quote unquote here. Uh, that's the you know, that's camera out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she said she was down downtown, and there was a woman on the street, you know, a raggedy-looking woman on the street with her hand on asking for money, because she was hungry. She had to eat. She needed food. So there was a Starbucks right there. She said, "Come on in." She takes this woman into the Starbucks. She gets her a cup of coffee and some kind of great big breakfast, uh, or whatever it was. Right? And then she's gonna throw it away in the end. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So they walk out, and and, and so. The lady that bought the stuff goes one way, and the woman she gave it to goes the other way, and and she turns around and looks. She, she throws pitches at a trash can. She didn't want that. She wanted the money for dope or whatever, booze, you know. Right. So so what's we, we see this attitude. And so how how are we supposed to handle that? What does the author say? Does he address something like uh, that? We're looking at Rachman. We're not saying you should give your money. Look ah, at who do but, you have, who's your compassion on? Oh, but, you have to have you have to look at that woman who we want who we hold up as a poster child or why we shouldn't give money. No. Okay, well, that's why we're holding that woman up as a poster child. This is why you don't give money. So, but uh, ah, what I'm saying is that you have to look at that and have compassion on that and say, never. So it's like uh, what is it? Who is it? Davin for Benjamin the woman. Franklin. Is it, when he, uh, when he sees uh, the poor guy in the street, uh, was uh, uh, there, uh, 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 how's the expression go? Uh, there, uh, but for... Uh, um, but for the grace of God. Grace go of I. God. There go I, but for the grace of God. Uh, that's not so that. that's, yeah. that's, that would be the compassionate right. view. Right. And like I said, if you can help them, you should help them. But if, uh, if, if you, you can't... If you know they're going to throw it away. If you can't help them, so... Uh, but right. you, should have, you shouldn't look at them and judge them 
as you haven't been in their shoes right yeah. that, that's what it is that's yeah. all right. So he says, one should exert himself as much as possible to, co to cultivate within himself the trait of mercy, just as one would want others to have mercy on him in his time of need, so he should have mercy on others who are in need, as is written, and you shall love your fellow man as yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. Uh, the creator, blessed be he, imbued his righteousness, righteous servants with mercy so that they would be distinguished by this trait, as we find in Yos with Yosef, because his mercy was aroused. And so that is, uh, the more a person is imbued with the meter of mercy, the trait of mercy, the greater the feeling of compassion will be in the sight, at the sight or news of somebody, someone else's suffering. One who lacks this trait will not respond to even the most heart-wrenching troubles of others. Yosef, who was imbued with the mercy, meter, uh, the trait of mercy, was stirred and moved to tears when he realized that they would have no choice but to put his brother Binyamin through the ordeal of the goblet. This, says the Nesiv, was what aroused Yosef's mercy. But this can be, happen only to someone who aspires to higher levels of mercy and sensitizes himself to the feelings and hardships of others. So that really that's what you're trying to do. You want to try to put yourself in their shoes so that you understand what's going on. The Creator, blessed be He, imbued His righteous. I'm sorry, I said that. It befits the wise man that the trait of uh, mercy and compassion be planted in his heart all his days. He says the words the wording implies that one should constantly work toward attaining this trait. Merely waiting for a merciful situation to arise and hoping that feeling of compassion will kick in may be wishful thinking, but is not likely to occur. One must be prepared in advance in order to react pro appropriately. The only way to accomplish this is for one to be v vigilant in attuning himself to the seriousness and importance of the trait. And with God's help, he will respond properly. He said, once we, uh, often we read or hear about the intense anguish that great Torah sages feel for the suffering of others. However, such, such empathy does not necessarily come naturally. Rather, its result of any of us sensitizing their emotional nerve endings, quote unquote nerve endings, mm -hmm. until they, res they learn to respond to the hurt of others. It was this kind of preparation that forced Rav Chaim Soloveitchik to sleep on the floor of the local shul the night after a fire destroyed a half of the city of Brisk. Mm -hmm. How can I sleep comfortably in my bed, he said, knowing that others don't have a roof over their head, let alone a bed to sleep on. Mm -hmm. This is reaction of someone who has toiled to make the trait of mercy part of his essence, someone who cannot help but feel the pain and suffering of others. Mm -hmm. So he's giving examples, we'll have to stop here, but he's giving examples of how to attune ourselves to other people's sufferings and to engender with that the feelings of mercy. Okay.